Hi, and brother. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I am Tishan Naika from South Africa. Um, I've been a part of the Sai organization. I've come to know Swami from a very young age, um, possibly from birth, two or three. My parents don't actually know how to put a finger on a, a pinpoint on the, on the point when Swami came into their lives. But um, my mom always says that I was, um, I'd say, a catalyst for their involvement in the organization or getting close to Swami. Um, I was very ill as a child, um, underwent some operations and uh, actually ended up um, having to be resuscitated at two years old. And um, during this time, I was so ill and uh, riddled with infection that I was on adult doses of uh, antibiotics and used to have tremors and, uh, you know, wasn't very stable as a child. Um, health was touch and go for many years. And I think the Sai Center in the community provided the support to my parents in that time. And uh, I think that's how we uh, grew closer to the organization and to Swami. But the organization fitted in with our fa family's values very well because my mom came from a, a Hindu background and my dad came from a Christian background. And uh, I think Swami's teachings and values kind of brought them closer together in terms of their values and beliefs and uh, just brought the family into this new kind of dimension of reconciling all different religions and beliefs into one beautiful uh, segment that was, you know, the way of we're going forward in terms of our relationship with Swami. Um, moving on from there, I think throughout life, we weren't um, very active in the organization, especially after my uh, father's tra tragic passing in 1997. Oh, Thank you, brother. So it actually... You must have been that time. Though. Three years old. Oh. So it was uh, very sudden, very traumatic and... Uh, actually an, un, an unsolved case up to today. Oh. Yeah, so it's, um, that obviously shook the faith uh, at home. He went to work on his 40th birthday, and then he never came home. After searching for six days, they found his body in the harbor, floating in the water for six days. So at that time, because the body had been in the water for so long, it had lost a lot of the potential evidence that could have led to some solution to this whole uh, case, but uh, nothing could be found. And it's been what, 27 years later, and um, we found peace, but uh, it's been a tough journey. Yeah. So and that shook the faith at home. Um, and uh, we still went uh, and observed major functions. Uh, events, Swami's birthday, I still attended SSE. Um, we still had Swami's photos at home, but we weren't as involved as we used to be. But when we moved to Johannesburg, Pretoria, um, you know, about 600 kilometers away, it was almost like a new start for us. And once again, the Sai Center and the Sai family uh, was there in their full support. And uh, when we moved, uh, the Sai Center was there for us. And once again, Swami pulled us uh, and uh, slowly, slowly started getting more involved, uh, started uh, attending bhajans, getting more involved in center in young adult activities, sevas, and ultimately bhajans was my calling at that time. I got very involved and Swami showed his presence in my life in many ways. But the pivotal point, and it's funny that uh, we're having this conversation because I asked my mother um, just last week prior to the conference, did you ever think that I would be able to be involved in something of this nature, something of this enormous thing that we're doing this conference and uh, being able to do Swami's work um, on this scale? And, and she pinpoints the, the story that I'm going to tell you now. When I was 15, my mom came home from work one day and she said that, uh, you know these frequent flyer miles that you get? She said her miles were going to expire. And she says, uh, who wants to go somewhere? You were 15. I was 15. Mm -hmm. so who wants to go somewhere? My sister was at about 19 at the time. And uh, I think she said it more as a joke. And uh, I took this offer very seriously. And I said, I'm going. And she says, well, where are you going? She said, <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to push my I'm going to push Auntie. This was in 2009. And um, 
She says, but I only have enough for one ticket. I can't come with you. I, I said, it's fine. I'm going. So against all the odds, uh, we actually still don't know how the logistics worked, worked out because as a minor, you're actually not allowed to travel alone. And um, I ended up going to Prashanti and spending the month there over Christmas, celebrated my 16th birthday in Prashanti as well. But the moment, I think, in my mom's mind, uh, she's, she says that when she left me at the security checkpoint at the airport, she says, as a 15-year-old, I walked with such conviction. I walked with conviction. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't scared. Um, I didn't turn around many times to look back at her, whatever. I held my head and I walked. And this is something that's imprinted in her mind. So last week when I was asking if she ever thought, she says, the moment you walked that way, I knew Swami was with you. And I knew that he was the one that was carrying you throughout life's journey. You know, he says, no 15-year-old would walk that way. And... Um, that was your first trip where you saw Swami. The first time I saw Swami was in 2004. We went as a family. Um, but that was a short trip. And uh, yeah, at, at that time, it was more to experience, you know, just to experience. This was more of a yearning to go. This was actually Swami, you know, pulling me. And uh, I got there and the entire trip um, from start to end was nothing short of miraculous. It was, I can't even begin to explain the things. And one of the points, uh, the key stories that comes to mind is uh, the, the year prior, so 2008, I had a, a, a small heart procedure. So my flight from South Africa, Johannesburg, was through Frankfurt then from Frankfurt to Bangalore. In Frankfurt, I uh, ended up sitting next to uh, what looked like an auntie, so I started chatting. And she told me that she's originally from Pune, she's a cardiologist, and she's working in the US. She's going home for the holidays. And um, we started chatting, and I told her, you know, about my heart condition. And whatever. She says, um, well, technically, you shouldn't be flying. And <laughs> we're in the air now, what can I do? <laughs> And she says, you know, it's a risk. You've got a device in your heart and potentially you could have some issues, especially with the blood pooling in your legs and clots and all of that. She says, the only thing that could help you now is compression socks. Do you have any? And I said, no, I never thought to wait. I was never told to. So what should I do? And she says, you know what? This is very curious. And I said, what, auntie? She says, this morning when I was packing my bag to come, I had my compression socks on, wearing it already. But I felt the need to take another pair. And I didn't put it in my luggage, I didn't put it in my hand luggage. I put it in my camera bag. And where was her camera bag? On her lap. Took it out, gave it to me, everything was fine. And everything in that trip for the full month fell into place that can only be described as form as well. I was, uh, had the good fortune of being in the children's choir that year. And uh, Auntie Alma, the choir conductor at the time, afforded me uh, the opportunity of presenting the Christmas card to Swami. And I went up to Swami and I had that blissful experience of being next to the master of the universe and experiencing his love at such a short, close distance. Um, asked him if I could take part in Namaskar and he, he agreed. We did the Christmas performance and um, one of the things that after the, the, the choir performance, Swami was sitting on the chair and he just moved his fingers slightly. And somehow I knew he was calling me. It was, it, there was thousands and thousands of people, but in my heart I knew it was me. And I went up to him and uh, I spent a moment and then uh, that's when he started giving out the material to the boys and he just said, pay attention. And then, thank you, Swami, went down. But the next day, I had not a squeak of a voice, not even a sound. And I phoned my mother back home and... What do you got from the infection? Nothing. And the, the day, two days after it was fine. And my mother asked me, what, what's wrong? What, I, she's worried. I'm so, I'm so young. I'm so far away. What's going on? And um, I said, Mom, I, I, I sang last night and I gave my voice to Swami. Right? Because <laughs> night I went to bed, voice was there next morning. Many years later, I did a podcast with a brother from South Africa around, around the Vedas. My, my journey through Swami's work has led me very strongly into the Vedas. So uh, I'm now serving as the International Young Adult Vedas Coordinator, along with Sister Marini in the UK. And Vedas is my passion. I teach Vedas as much as I can, chant Vedas as much as I can. 
Um, and when I was having this podcast and I was relating the story to the brother, he said, how interesting. I said, what do you mean, brother? He says, that many years ago, you said you gave your voice to Swami. And now Swami is using your voice to teach a Vedas. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, whether it's true or not, Swami knows, but it's a nice thought to have. I'll, I'll chant a small portion from the um, Narayana Upanishad and I'll explain why. So the, the part that I really like is, Nishkalo niranjano nirvikalpo nirakya tashuddho deva eko narayanaha. The reason I like that one is it describes God as blemishless. Crude translation in English, but for me that word blemishless solidifies in my mind that there are no mistakes. And whenever I'm feeling down, things are not working out, Swami, why is this happening? That word blemishless comes to mind. It tells me that Swami makes no mistakes. Nothing happens by accident. There is a reason for this. There is a reason that I'm experiencing this. The reason I'm going through this. And that phrase blemishless quite nicely encapsulates that in my life. And um, it's, it's been a beautiful journey and uh, something that I've enjoyed. And, and Swami's roped me in, in, may, in ways that I never imagined to do things I never thought I could ever do. I think, um, you know, even, um, even if I look at the passing of my dad, right, it's obviously a, a tough pill to swallow, um, especially as a family and, you know, having to struggle through it. But a couple of years ago, uh, my mom and I are having a conversation about it. And uh, she says, but what if he was here? How different? How would life be? And I actually took a moment and I said, but why? Why should we even think that way? Our life, our life is good. It is the way Swami wants us. Who knows? Maybe we wouldn't be as close to Swami. Life would be different. We would be somewhere else. We'd be doing other things. The road that we have gone down through with all the experiences has led us to where we are today, which is a good place in our lives. We are happy. We are content. We, um, we share a lot with each other. We share a lot with the people around us. And we share Swami's love. And I'm grateful for the experiences that have made me the person I am today and made me the person that can do Swami's work in the way I am. Swami, um, when I was studying and I think when I, when I needed his assurances more, when I, when I didn't have, I would say, as much trust and faith in his, in his will and his plan, he used to show himself often in my dreams, often patting my head in his lap when I was going through rough exams or something. But um, once or twice, there was just amazing experiences. I remember when I was in university, I was staying at uh, one of my friend's places. We were studying late into the night, and we were writing an exam the next morning. And my car had gone in to uh, get some work done, so I had taken out you know, all my CDs and all the things. And I like to play and listen to bhajans, calms me down before an exam. Actually, I mostly listen to bhajans, but because of that, I couldn't listen to bhajans. And I was feeling so anxious for this exam. And I was driving from my, my friend's place to the university to, to go and write my exam. And I'm thinking to myself, Swami, I just, I need to hear a bhajan. I need to hear your voice, uh, your name. I need to feel that assurance from you. And I was listening to a random radio, radio station. It's um, an Indian radio station. So sometimes they play devotional music, but only on a Friday evening. They have set program times when they play. And this was a weekday morning. And as I had that thought, brother, it was the most amazing thing. Manas Bhajare starts playing on the radio. Immediately. And I burst into tears while driving. It was something I, can, I can't even imagine how it happened or that it even happened at all. But it was beautiful. It was a, such a beautiful experience. So when uh, I was in the children's choir, heading back home, uh, eventually uh, got to the airport and uh, coincidentally was on the same flight as Auntie Alma, flying back to uh, Frankfurt, via Frankfurt, back to Johannesburg. And um, so we flew together to Frankfurt and uh, she took care of me very much like a mother, buying me hot chocolate, making sure I was okay and uh, you know, just connecting. And towards the end of the trip where we were parting ways, Auntie Alma says, you know, that card you presented to Swami with all the signatures of all the children in the choir. They've given it back to me. So the fact that I've met you here today, I feel like that needs to come back to you. 
So that was also an amazing coincidence and or science sense and a blessing to have this piece of history almost, you know, something that the avatar has touched um, with me always. You want just your voice, you want to give your power <laughs> <back>. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, but there's amazing such incidents. And, you know, even if I look at my journey through the Vedas, I have my, my Balvikas teacher, uh, who's been a guru and a teacher and a guide to me and also my spiritual mother in many ways for many, many years, since I was four years old. And um, she started encouraging me to learn the Vedas and uh, mantras. And from the time I started learning, she always said, you will teach, you will teach, you will teach. I said, I don't want to teach. I don't have the ambition. I'm happy to just you know, learn. I don't want to do any more than that. And she says, no, you will teach. Every time she spoke to me and I said, Auntie, I don't want to teach, please, you know. <laughs> Next thing I was teaching, I wasn't just teaching one day, I was teaching five days a week in five different size centers. Throughout COVID, we had um, online chanting of Sri Rudram every single evening for two years, um, just to in encourage people, give them that opportunity, get through all the hardship and difficulties they were facing at the time. And Vedam uh, has become, I think, the center of my life um, and has led me down paths that I would never have imagined to do Swami's work. So you're looking for a miracle, it's that I'm even here at all. Where it's never been an ambition of mine to be um, serving Swami in this capacity. I was always happy just doing my little bit. Uh, but Swami had bigger plans. And that, that for me is a miracle. Even in my personal life, in my career and things, the way Swami has worked a plan. Uh, one of the things was when I was in university, I had to do vacational work. And I worked, walked into this place that one of the uncles from the Sai Center was working at. And I walked in and it was just great. They were building robotics and it was, it had almost like a, a Google kind of environment. You know, beanbag chairs, open offices, very cool, young engineers building things. And I walked in in my third year and I said, I want to work here. And uh, I just, I just said it like, this is great. I just want to work here. And um, four years after I, uh, graduated, I ended up working there. <laughs> exactly the same company, same department, same people. And uh, all is just Swami's will. When I walked in on my first day, after having a uh, difficult working environment prior to that, I walked into the building and the lady was taking me uh, around, showing me the building and showing me my office. And I get to my office, office number 108. <laughs> It was amazing. My ambition is to, at this point, surrender myself to Swami, do his work. I think uh, wherever I've had my own plans, Swami showed me that he has his own too. <laughs> and that his will is more than <laughs> mine in many more ways. So, his plan is better than yours? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in ways I could never imagine as well. So uh, surrender to Swami and do his work. It's uh, become a passion of mine as well to, to grow Swami's work. Um, we've recently started a Sai Center that's growing in leaps and bounds. That's able to, uh, yeah. in South Africa, Premadhara Sai Center. And um, it's, it's become a hub of young adults as well. It's one of the few centers that I know of that's growing in young adult participation. And it's got a very strong, vibrant energy and allows us to do a lot of work because of the energy and drive for Swami.